This is Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. I got with me my co Chuck Nice. Chuck. Hey, Neil. Yeah. I, you know, we do a lot of topics, but uh, I think there's a topic we don't give enough attention to. Okay. And that's the search for dark skies on Earth. As a city person, you know, I grew up in New York City. The, the whole notion of a dark sky didn't have many meaning because uh, my only dark sky was the local planetarium, the Hayden Planetarium. Right. And so an artificial and, dark sky. Yeah, but artificial. In, a way, in a way, that's kind of cool. They created a dark sky just for you. Yes. Knowing I'd come back a few decades later and serve as director. Director. <laughs> and you know what? And they're just like, God, that was a good investment. Look at that. <laughs> Look how that so worked just, out. Just to show you that I'm not weirdly odd in this way, okay. uh, I'm not the only one out there who loves dark skies. Let me bring on my friend and colleague, Matt O'Dowd, is an, a fellow astrophysicist, a host of PBS Space Time. I want to ask you about yeah. that. Uh, associate professor of astronomy and astrophysics at Lehman College at CUNY, the City University of New York. And you're also an associate here at the American Museum of Natural History. How are you doing, Matt? I'm doing great, Neil. Thank you very much. Good to see okay. you. Okay. So, Matt, uh, what do, what do dark skies mean to you? Especially since they're not everywhere. You got to, like, look for them and find them. Yeah. I, I grew up in the suburbs, you know, maybe not quite as bright as New York City, but uh, I, you know, I remember my first dark sky as a kid. You know, I thought, there are there are so many stars, you know, in my little suburban neighborhood you know, there's at least a hundred. <laughs> but then you go to, you know, the outback Australia, where it's pretty dry anyway. Um, and you look up and, and you, you can't even find a spot of sky that doesn't have a star. Wow. Spectacular. I didn't see a dark sky that m matched what I saw in a planetarium until I went deep into Pennsylvania, far, I had to cross New Jersey. You know, cross the moat oh, wow. around Manhattan. You, you say called. that like it was like such a a, tr a drudgery. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the drudgery! I I actually, I actually had to we had to Barely swim across it. the Hudson. <laughs> I swam across the Hudson, and then we got into a Conestoga wagon and we made our way New to Jersey. Pennsylvania across <laughs> New Jersey. So Pennsylvania is rural, yeah. and then I got to see a night sky, you know, as nature had intended it, not even realizing that that's just a sky in the Northeast right. where there's humidity, there's um, some light leakage on the horizon because even hundreds of miles away, you can see city lights. And so uh, why don't you uh, remind us what the value of being in a desert is for stargazing? You know, there, there are two big things, right? There's the fact that deserts are big and so you're probably far away from any town people don't build a lot of towns in the middle of deserts uh I, I was at a town in the middle of the biggest desert in australia so alice springs which is in the dead center of australia um recently actually and uh i mean you just get a little way out of town and look up and um i don't remember seeing a sky like that so you, you have the proximity to light and you, as you say you want to be hundreds of miles away okay in the middle of australia you're a thousand miles away but then there's the dryness, and the dryness is key. Um, so the, the water in the atmosphere causes, as, um, as the light trickles down from the stars, it, it, it sort of bounces the light around on its way down. And so Trickles. The stars look, it's moving at the speed of light, dude. Trickles. Trickles. On a cosmic scale, on a cosmic oh, okay, scale, okay, that's okay, a fine. crawl. Fine. It's uh, eight <laughs> minutes to get from the sun. It's like, oh, okay. oh I can make it. I can I'll give make it to it. you. Trickles no, down. Called, like, trickling, but okay. Pizza yeah, pats on. But it, but it uh -huh. also bounces around. So when you look up at the stars in you know somewhere where, where there's some humidity, uh, you you see these blurry blobs. Okay, so you so you and you don't really know you don't really notice until you see the sky from a desert or a dry mountaintop, which is where we like to build our observatories. Then there are these pinpricks, these crystal clear pinpricks, um, and man, <laughs> it's it's stunning. It's like at the Hayden Planetarium. Yeah, just like the planetarium. <laughs> so many people don't think of the water molecule as something that matters in the night sky. It just gives you rain, of course, but yeah. all the best observatories in the world are in deserts wow. for, for this reason. Yeah. yeah. 
yeah, you don't want the water. Plus, if you do have water, then it can make clouds and then it can mm-hmm. rain. And yeah. Exactly. That, yeah. you know? So deserts are good for there being little rain, which means there's very few clouds typically. Yeah, and you can actually and, see fainter stars that way. You know, the this the, when the star gets blurred out a little bit, then what we call the surface brightness goes down. And so so as long, if you concentrate all of that starlight into a single point, your eye is going to be able to pick up fainter far stars and further away. I forgot about that. That's right. right. Because <laughs> if you smear out the light, then it might not be bright enough to trigger your detection threshold. Exactly. But concentrate it all into one spot. And there it is, it's a, mm-hmm. a, a pin prick of light. Now, in the United States, we have places that can be far away from cities. And, you know, I think of the mountain time zone, of course, you know, I mean, definitely not the West Coast or the East Coast. W- where have you been? What are some places you've been? So let's see. Um, I mean, you know, I've seen some good stuff in New York uh, also, but, you know, many, 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 but a little bit blurry. Um, but mm-hmm. exactly as you head west, you know, the middle of the country, um, the northeast is good, but you know, again, a bit of humidity. But, but you know, those central states, uh, Nevada is probably where I've done most of my stargazing, I would say. Really? Oh, really? Nevada, yeah. Nevada, oh. yeah, of all places. Um, you've, I mean, it's a, an amazing state. You've got Las Vegas, you've got Reno, cool cities, but pretty quick to get away from them, you know, hop in a car. Um, and oh, I get it. So what, what Nevada did was it took all the city lights and put them into just two cities. <laughs> pretty, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. Pretty so much. They, all they, centralized, the they centralized all the yeah. city lights. Whereas the Northeast is just towns all the way up. You know. It's right. sprawling, it's continual exactly. Northeast corridor. Okay. So you put them all in one place, and then that leaves the rest of the state. Because I was in Montana. I got a, a similar sense of that. You know, they call it big sky country. Hmm. But what good is a big sky if it's cloudy? You know, it's not, it doesn't matter. So okay. Montana is not in the desert uh, latitudes. All right. And so you, if you go down south, what's interesting is that about, between 30 and 35 degrees north latitude okay. is all the great deserts of the northern hemisphere. So you get the Mojave Desert, the Gobi Desert, the... Um, the Sahara Desert, oh, the and India would be a desert were it not for the monsoon. And India, you know, is right on those uh, parallels, thirty to thirty-five degrees. So, so anyway, so if you so if you go into the United States, mountain time zone, so you're away from civilization, right? And you get desert that pretty much localizes where you can do this, right, Matt? Yeah, I mean, it's the it's the best of where you could do it, absolutely. Um, yeah, you know, people do good astronomy everywhere because people are amazing. But, but you know, for me, Nevada, Black Rock Desert in Nevada is my favorite spot. In a way, it's, it's, uh, it, it kind of balances because uh, we can see uh, Las Vegas from space, but in the rest <laughs> of the state, you can see space from there. <laughs> exactly. it's not, not a, it, Very it's, clever. It's a perfect balance. That's like a, that's like a so slogan fair. or something. That's, that's going to be on a bumper sticker, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you get the benefit of the desert, So and which means also clear skies. Clear, huh? And so so where did you observe? What, what precisely, Matt? So the Black Rock Desert, uh, which is a few hours out of Reno, um, is a an alkali flat. So it's this huge, many mile wide alkali flat, ancient, ancient lake bed. Strange place, actually. It's um, you know this this super basic uh, uh, dust on the and very flat. You can drive on this surface, okay, most of the year, you know, with your eyes closed. There's nothing for miles. Uh, don't do that, kids. <clears throat> um, and and so when when the dust isn't up in a a storm, it is crystal clear. Um, so I, I've I've been there a few times. I've been there with a, a group a group of colleagues who who run what's called the Black Rock Observatory, and they bring a big telescope, like a meter wide uh, diameter mirror telescope. And so but it's still it's, portable. If they bring it, it's portable. It's it's marginally portable. Yeah, marginally portable. <laughs> it, it, it is portable. Though. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It takes a small van, but yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So now let me just ask this as a city dweller myself. Um, when you're out there in the desert, is there a Ritz-Carlton nearby? 
<laughs> just in case you I'm need just to. saying. I mean, if I want to spend the night. Yeah, there's a five, there's a five star hotel right in the Black Rock Desert. <laughs> it's there, of course. No, wait, wait, just got to know how Chuck. to. It's got to know how to find it. Ask the locals. <laughs> Chuck, Chuck, you're on a call with two astrophysicists. It's not you're not spending the night anywhere. You're spending the day. Ah, oh, that's right, because the night is where the action is, baby. <laughs> the night is that's our right. day. We are indeed creatures of the night. Take yes. that, take that, Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> we'll show you how to do it all night long. <laughs> oh, look, so what, just another bumper sticker. Astronomers do it all night long. <laughs> yeah, I know. That, no, we had, that's an old one. That's an old is one. Is that an old one? Uh, oh, very old. Oh, okay, very old. cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So- so Matt, what were your favorite targets of the night sky? Most of the year, you can see some some good deep sky objects, and you know the the nebulae are the most beautiful if you can see them well. Okay, so the the remnants of stars that have ended their lives and blown off their outer layers, and so everyone's seen these these crazy configurations of colorful gas out there in space. So with a really good telescope, those are, are gems, um, but um, you know, the Andromeda galaxy is a winner, I think, because it's so bright. You know, you can actually see the Andromeda galaxy with the naked eye at a good dark sky, dark sky site. Wow. You know, it's, it's, plus, it's, plus, it's, it's a northern hemisphere object. You all don't it's get a northern that hemisphere southern. object, added bonus. It's, uh, it's two and a half million light years away. But, yeah. you know, if you know how to look at it, which is just off where it actually is, you see uh, this distant giant galaxy just right there but you're talking um, about averted vision can you explain that? averted vision exactly right staring yeah. right at it it sort of fades out curious effect the one the one thing that you can't go past that if you want to wow um you know the locals is saturn showing people saturn through a telescope is the most mystical experience for someone who hasn't experienced you know all of this stuff previously and it's matt what a, impresses me is you can show it to them through a telescope, and it's nowhere near as richly displayed as a Hubble photo they might see online, yet this still blows their mind. Yeah, because you, that, can see, you can see the rings. I, well, I, you I, see I'm, it in a I'm, photo. I'm, I'm, just, you, I'm just saying. But there's something about, I, I mean, I, I, I know exactly what Matt's moment. talking about. Because the, two, the, the first two things I ever saw through a telescope, the first, of course, was the moon. Okay, and yeah. you get to see, and you're like, "Oh my God!" Like it's, right, I'm right. right there. I'm on right. the moon. I can't <laughs> mm-hmm. believe I'm on the moon. And the mm-hmm. second was Saturn. And even though, um, when you look at like Cassini and these images, right, where you just see the these Cassini ing- space probe to Saturn, yeah, thank you. Uh, mm-hmm. And you see like how detailed the rings are, and you can like, and they they almost look like this little ballet of debris going around the planet, but. You can't see it like that through a telescope, but you you know it's it looks like bright, kind of blown out version of that Cassini image, but it's so detailed in that it's actually so different with the rings, and you can make it out, and it's like the only thing that you know in the sky, like you know what I mean, like you've never looked up in the sky before, you know Saturn has rings, and then you're seeing it. Something oh, see. about that is something it's confirming about confirming evidence. Confer- yeah, confirm- there it is. Confirmatory that's, evidence. That's it. It's confirmatory yeah. evidence. It's like, oh yeah. my God, I'm really looking yeah. out. Yeah. Into Somehow, space. all those Cassini movies or Hubble photos, like, you know, we're so spoiled on, you know, amazing CGI these days it, that part of us maybe doesn't believe that it's real. But when the photons come from Saturn directly through the telescope and hit you in the eye, then there's no denying it. Because you know, the you, your immediate photons. sense of the size of the universe. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so cool. So, so Matt, I hear that uh, Nevada has a dark sky sanctuary. What is that? I mean, you know, a dark sky sanctuary is a um, a region where there's regulation about the types of lights that can be um, in a certain region. Um, um, you know, so it's, it's it's possible to do lighting in a way that doesn't destroy the sky. You know, you don't have to shine all your lights straight up. Yeah. How about you don't you have shine to them down? All of your buildings yeah, down. How down? That's yeah, pretty. If you're in an airplane and you fly That's over where you need it, down. And, and you can see a street light. Somebody's paying to send light to your eyeball in the, in the airplane. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay. So what's what do you 
you know, it looks bleak, everything I've read about the future of dark skies. Yeah. So it seems like these are these are cherished places, yeah. few places left on Earth. Yeah, so the expansion of the cities, more and more towns in between cities until you have the whole country, maybe the world being the Northeast Corridor. Uh, and there are some spots that presumably will never become cities. You know, there are the spots in Nevada. I doubt the Black Rock Desert will become a city. But these places become more and more distant to most people. And so fewer and fewer, fewer people, you know, have access. And kids growing up are less and less likely to see more than 100 stars in the sky. To your point earlier that people are growing up without any relationship to the night sky, they don't even know to look up and be curious about it. I think we will lose something deeply if that's the world, if that's the next generation that's going to lead the world. They'll have no sense of the the paths of curiosity that led us into the universe. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to know how important it was or how lucky we are that we have a transparent atmosphere. I mean, you know, obviously it, it's good that it's transparent that we, that we can see, but it's tra- transparent all the way to space. We can imagine situations where you have this permanent cloud cover at some level and we wouldn't even know that the universe existed beyond. Our Matt, atmosphere. I think about that all the time. Oh, really? All the time. If we grew up on the surface of Venus, which has a very thick cloud cover, <clears throat> now Venus doesn't happen to have a moon, but if it did, we would, have, we would just look at the tides come in and out mysteriously. Right. And have no understanding of it. We we have no idea that there was a night sky with stars and nebulae and the Andromeda galaxy. There'd be no cosmology until someone ascended through the air and emerged on the top of the clouds and imagined the first But would we even get there? How instrumental was the night sky in sparking that curiosity? Oh, curiosity to, you to, fly, to fly in the first place, yeah. So that's a very good point, Matt, I had not considered, that the curiosity stimulators are looking to a place that you otherwise cannot reach and asking yourself, how can I, how will I ever reach it? Well, then again, somebody would have looked up and said, I wonder what's beyond those puffy things up there. I wonder what's behind that, that canopy uh-huh. that's above us. You yeah, know? not everybody, but some some do. They take it yeah. a bit longer, but yeah. In fact, in the latest Star Talk book, we devote chapters and chapters to that kind of state of mind. You know, what is beyond... Uh, it's titled to infinity and beyond the infinity is a moving target in the 1700s. If I say, go to the moon, say that's not possible. So the moon is at infinity to you for all your, for all, you know, right. You can't ever get there. Well, plus you need new laws of physics and this mythical magical substance called rocket fuel and a rocket on top of that, then you can get to the moon, but that's completely mythical at that stage. So yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued by this. So Matt, just, Describe your emotions when you're out under the night sky now as a professional astrophysicist. If you were not an amateur astronomer, but now as a professional astrophysicist, what emotions come over you? You know, some people have asked whether understanding the universe too well takes away the magic. Uh, The opposite, it expands and uh, amplifies all of the experience. So I now, now when I go out under the night sky, I mean, my first impulse is the same childlike, holy crap, look at all those stars. But now I have, I guess, the apparatus to be able to imagine this vast three-dimensional universe and the distance between the stars and me on this spinning orb of rock and all of this stuff. So I can, I can sort of, hold that model to the stars. And um, yeah, it's a good man. It's, it's a good trip. That it's, sounds so cool. Yeah, I still well up when I when I go to mountaintops and I look up to the night yeah. sky. If I'm alone and just the eerie silence of just me, the mountainside, and the night sky. Well, Matt, it's been a delight to have you. And, and remind me what, uh, what kind of stuff you do on PBS's Space Time. Oh, sure. We do astrophysics astronomy and and physics and we go we go pretty hard in a lot of areas you know we're doing uh, a bunch of quantum mechanics episodes right now so you know if there's anything weird it's a real learning experience yeah yeah. people learn all right come and check it out okay 
Okay. All right. We'll do that. Our next guest is a National Geographic explorer, astrophotographer, and science photojournalist. Meet Babak Tafreshi. Hey, Star Talk fans. I wanted to take a quick moment to thank our partners at TravelNevada.com. You know, with this week's partial eclipse and the total eclipse happening in early 2024, we're quickly reminded of how important it is to get outside and to look up. But if you're in a big city like I am, you know that it is near impossible to fully appreciate all that the night sky has to offer. So as home to more of the last true dark skies than anywhere in the lower 48 states, we want to encourage you to consider Nevada when booking your next cosmic adventure. Want to go on a guided tour through the stars led by dark sky rangers? Well, journey to the Great Basin and book a spot on the Star Train. As one of 17 international dark sky sanctuaries worldwide, you can also visit the Masker Rim Wilderness Study Area. Scary name, great place to look up. Look, I put that telescope of yours to good use? Well, check out the constellations from the Tonopah Stargazing Park. And a quick tip from us to you, these places are remote. So if you're traveling there, be sure to bring a map because your cell phone might not work. And yes, I am talking about a physical map, the kind that you unfold and then you can never fold back the way you've unfolded it. All right, as always, we here at Star Talk encourage you to keep looking up and to get out there by visiting TravelNevada.com. That's TravelNevada.com for your next night sky adventure. This is Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist, with my co-host Chuck Nice. Chuck. Yes, Neil. What's happening? We've got with us, right, in the house, Babak. Tafreshi. Did I say that right? Babak. Babak. Perfect. Perfect. You are an astrophotographer, <laughs> a space photojournalist, which sounds like you go to space to get pictures, right. but that's probably not what it is, right. but that's what it sounds like. A Cosmo National paparazzi, <laughs> man. Cosmo <laughs> paparazzi. Yeah, let's get a close-up on that lander, right? Yeah. Uh, so, a Opus National Centauri, Geographic... Opus over here, over here, Opus Centauri. <laughs> <laughs> Smile. This way. Who are you wearing? Who are you wearing? <laughs> <laughs> Your National Geographic Explorer. This is a highly... A privilege, coveted designation that goes to people who are scattered around the world doing their thing in the National Geographic family of uh, people bringing the universe to the rest of us. You're also an amateur astronomer, and we're going to find out why that is a badge of honor and not a denigration. Uh, you studied physics in school, love that, and you're an advocate for night skies, dark skies, and that's another good thing. And plus, you're a founder of the World at Night Initiative. We'll, we'll get into that when we uh, get back to that. And uh, so, let's 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 tell me what you're about, Babak. What 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 drives you? What where, what? How did it all begin? Mm. And what's your relationship with your mother? Let's get into this very deeply. <laughs> it very really deeply. begins. Let's it really, really get begins. into it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm originally from Iran, from Tehran. I'm an Iranian-American science journalist and photographer. Uh, my interest to astronomy started with the first look at the moon, like many others. At the age of 13, I borrowed this telescope on top of a roof in an apartment in Tehran, which is highly light polluted. Uh, had a look at the moon, I couldn't believe my eyes. You know, it was much more than the map I had in my hand all the craters, mountains, and this was just a tiny telescope, two inch, you know, all, I can remember that scene is still second by second. It was almost like being the Apollo orbiter going around the moon because I had no tracking with the telescope. So it was with the earth rotation, the, the scene was moving across, across the view. And I thought, you know, that would be cool to capture it on film. So that was the next night. Wait, wait, just to be failed. clear. You said something that I want to make sure you, our audience fully understands. You have a telescope that's not plugged in. It just points in one direction, and the moon is in the frame, but because Earth is rotating, the, what's in the frame is passing by, and the magnification of the telescope is such that you're basically observing the rotation of the Earth 
as the sky goes by your your field of view. Anytime you look through a telescope, that happens. Anytime you even take a picture of the sky, even with your phone, if you go beyond 30 seconds, you start to see stars are not pinpoint anymore or little trails. This is a fact for the Earth rotation. I mean, it's a very easy evidence of how Earth is rotating. Mm, and how mm. the sky is turning above us. Oh, that sounds kind of annoying, like it would ruin every picture. Well, it That's would. very true. That's very true. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we are limited with shorter exposures, less than 30 seconds, unless you use a device that tracks with the Earth's rotation, right. that can freeze the Earth's rotation, we call it the star tracker, or use a motor, motor attached to your telescope that can track the stars. I didn't have that, that tiny telescope. So that why, that's why the view was moving and it felt like being in an orbiter around the moon. So later on, I became an editor at Astronomy Magazine of Iran. I started a TV program for about 10 years. We had a weekly TV program on space and astronomy. I was highly inspired by Neil, in fact. I emailed you back in 90s, if you can remember, I'm not sure. Oh my but, gosh, uh, did I reply? Wow. Yeah. Did I, you did. You did. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. I get to, this, I get to, if, it, if you didn't, this would be very awkward right now. It would be an awkward <laughs> moment completely. But I, I do reply to all emails eventually. So yes, it's the eventually. Too, yeah. <laughs> well, so, very, yes, I'm glad to know that I replied. inspiring to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I was very inspired by Carl Sagan at the time until, you know, when he passed away, I wrote one of my first articles for Astronomy ma Magazine about Carl Sagan. And later, um, I started a program called The Board at Night in 2007. I was still based in Iran. And since the program became more and more global, with exhibitions here and there, I had to leave Iran because it was not possible with all the limitations from the government and also the sanctions and internet filtration. So me and my wife decided to leave to Germany and later on to the US. I became a National Geographic photographer in 2012 and recently much more involved with Nat Geo in, across the platform with the society and other parts of um, the platform of National Geographic. And just to remind people in this moment, the National Geographic platform is huge. We just published our third book in collaboration with National Geographic Books. Just came out like a week ago. And so uh, Nat Geo does a lot of different things uh, for this world or for our appreciation of the world. So we're, I guess we're in the family with you as well. So I just have to slip that yes. in there. Okay. Yeah. So in 2007, when the war at night started, I, I shifted from science journalism more into photography, but still in today photography, I try to bring in my science journalism passion into my visual storytelling. So every image to me has uh, has a title, has you know a subtitle, and all the elements of an article. Um, recently, I started to work on a project for National Geographic Society called Life at Night which brings the attention more to the ground, still at nighttime, and how animals are in relationship with natural night environment, how dark skies is important, not only to stargazers like us, hmm. but also to billions of animals who are nocturnal, right. and how light pollution is impacting that yeah. relationship. Ooh, uh, nobody very, uh, gives them a thought at all. Oh, my god! Nobody does. Uh, you know, right. um, you look at casinos, and casinos are extremely bright beyond, right. beyond what they should be. And uh, uh, you'll find that the indigenous bird population, wherever there are casinos, is totally screwed up. It's because Very the true. birds think it's daytime 24 hours a day. And yeah, more than 80% of birds in North America, which are migratory, right. they travel at night. They exactly. fly at night because it's safer to fly at night. There is no predator. And it's also less, uh, much more energy efficient without the heat. And because of um, night flying, they use stars for celestial navigation, as well as earth magnetic field and the landmarks. But light pollution is a new source of attraction to them and completely disrupt their navigation system. So they come down to the source of light. Right. And most of them, unfortunately, die either by losing the time, either impacting or getting lost in the cities. Wow. Well, so Chuck, when you said casinos, you mean the illumination of the casino yes. on the exterior right. when you said they're because, bright. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you'll often There's find really casinos in an isolated place. 
You oh, know, there so they think go. about it. You know, you like all of Las Vegas, right? <laughs> well, yeah, it's in a yeah. desert or Atlantic City. It's on the beach, or you know, yeah. Las Vegas is visible from it's visible from Saturn. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you know, but yeah, we did a project, in fact, about the light of Los Angeles and Las Vegas and the darkest sky of Death Valley. Um, within the border of Nevada and California, which is a darkest sky place. It's a designated international darkest sky park. And Las Vegas was boldly visible, almost like sunrise from 90 miles away. Then we went to 150 miles away. It was still visible. I even have a record from 220 miles away and there is still a glow. So this is well beyond the distance to your horizon. So it's not a matter of sight lines to the lights right? It's the glow in the air that it puts yes. up that you can still see because your horizon is what, maybe 20 miles away from wherever, wherever you happen the to stand? The actual horizon, maybe 30 miles. Yes. That's yeah. the actual horizon. Yeah. So there's oh some refraction impact too, because of the refraction, we see a further away horizon, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. that's uh, certainly called the sky glow. It's, um, it's a reflection of light from dust, from aerosol, from clouds in the sky. And the lower the place is, the more dusty it is, oh, the yeah, more there, sky glow it generates. Of course, right. And which makes mountaintops a good target for doing exactly. ob observing. Even close to the cities. It's very interesting. When you look at the light pollution maps looking for darkest sky places near you, the elevation is not there. That factor is not visible in the light pollution maps. And if you, for example, give you an example in Los Angeles, if you go to Mount Wilson Observatory, which is within the edge of the Los Angeles, you can see the Milky Way from Los Angeles with all that light, fair, barely visible, but still you can see the Milky Way. It's just like an impossible <laughs> dream to see, um, you know, 180 degrees of light of Los Angeles and the Milky Way is visible because it's 6,000 feet above the city. Mm. Uh -huh. I just have to add that Mount Wilson is where Edwin Hubble discovered th that galaxies are whole other, that fuzzy objects in the night sky are other galaxies, and he discovered the expanding universe, all of that <clears throat> in the 1920s. So we are in the centennial celebration of these discoveries. Not only that, yes. quantum physics was formulated in the 1920s as well, all at Mount Wilson Observatory. So that's pretty wow. cool. In fact, Neil, 100 years, the 100 years anniversary of uh, discovery of expansion of universe, it's coming in October. Mm. Wow. Okay. I'm going to put that on my calendar. <laughs> <laughs> break, out, break out some champagne. So you said that Death Valley in Nevada on the border of uh, California was a dark skies site. Is that like a sanctuary or what does it mean to be a dark skies site? Uh, I work in partnership sometimes with a nonprofit called International Dark Sky Association and or darkersky.org is where they put all the resources they have. And they have designated more than 200 sites worldwide in more than 20 countries, in fact. Uh, one of them is in Nevada. And these places are um, dark enough to see the Milky Way. Some of them are known as sanctuaries, as you mentioned. These are the top level, the darkest, some of the best observatories in the world, for example, um, Mauna Kea or um, observatories in Chile. There are in such places where the Milky Way is, still looks like from the down of humankind, you can see it without any impact of light pollution. We still have those places. Then comes the darkest sky parks. There's some light glows on the horizon, but still it's beautiful. Like many of the Southwest parks um, is included in the darkest sky park designation. We have also darkest sky communities where people are trying to change lights to make the area more sky friendly, less light polluted. And these are different designations. And there's also another program by UNESCO, which has starlight reserves. Yeah, I'd be surprised if UNESCO didn't get a get a, get part of its interest in there because that's uh, they've been we their their scope is open from just cultural sites to mm -hmm. places that are we have a special relationship with nature and the world itself. Very true. I have a fast uh, International Dark Sky Association story where they got gangsta on me. 
That, Chuck, did I ever tell you that? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. When we opened the Rose Center for Earth and Space in the year 2000, in the middle of Manhattan, on Manhattan's Upper West Side, we had these tiny little pen lights in the, in the plaza area before you enter the building. And these tiny little 10 watt lights were pointing upwards. And I got a letter in the mail from the Dark Sky Association that said, you need to be an example for the rest of them and not have upward pointing lights. These were oh. tiny little pin lights in the pavement. And I thought that was gangster. That in, in yeah. Manhattan, <laughs> right? In Manhattan. Oh wow. my gosh. Yeah. So I, uh... I, I had to simultaneously love them and say, what the f- are you doing? <laughs> uh, yeah. I was going to say that. It's a little nitpicky. That's a little, a little nitpicky. A little nitpicky. You know? Yeah, but I but I de- definitely appreciated their sentiment. So, uh, Babak, you describe the World Night Initiative as combining art and culture. Um, you mention nocturnal animals, but in what ways art and culture are mixed in with this? Well, if you look at the images we take of the night sky, they're not necessarily scientific. We have two kinds of astrophotography, one made with telescopes, deep sky photography in in general it's called, and the other one is more called night escape photography, which includes earth and sky. They're mainly wide angle. In a wide angle image that resembles the field of view of human eye, you are not going to discover a galaxy. You're not going to discover a new comet. You're aiming for art, and you're aiming for oh. science communication. That's mm. where um, the art of astrophotography can be a platform to tell people about the importance of night to sky, principles of practical astronomy, and also the issue of light pollution. So you're talking about these pictures where someone is standing there with their arms up, you see the Milky Way in the background, there's a mountainscape and trees, and it's just a beautiful photo that includes the night sky. That's what you're talking about, right? That's right. Sometimes there's a story involved. I I try to include four factors in my photography and highly recommend to any viewer who's going to be an astrophotographer to have this in mind. Art, technique, these are very obvious for photography as a basis. Then comes the moment, could be a meteor, a comet, a wild animal at night, and a story. When these four come together, you have an image that can create an impact, can um, wow. keep in memory uh, of somebody I, who is viewing it. I um, love so that. If you, I love yeah. that. This is this is this, this, story this is, is time th- time honored process, right? This is oh my gosh, because because when you say it's just a picture of a, a cosmic object, I can tell the story of the cosmic object, but I can't bring it back to you. I can't right. make it real. I can't make a story that you then share with your next of kin, right? I, so this, how important this is through the history of civilization. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's very important to make it realistic. I like mm-hmm. to emphasize on that too, because today astrophotography could be generally based on composite images, stacking different right. exposures and putting them together in Photoshop. But it's important to, um, to consider that the elements of the sky are like the elements of the natural world. You cannot copy a mountain on top of a lake where it doesn't exist, unless it's for an artistic reason, not in documentary photography. And for the same reason, you cannot copy the moon from another part of the sky to wherever you like. This is like, to me, it's like cheetah on well, top of an It's a lie, is what it is yeah. at that <laughs> point. You're just yeah. lying. People do that all the time. Yeah. People, people that, especially the moon. And you know yeah. it because the, they don't typically when they do that, they don't know that people in the know know what yeah. the orientation of the moon needs to be to the horizon, depending on your latitude on Earth. And they'll right. just slap a moon there. Sometimes it's upside down. Sometimes it's backwards. Sometimes yeah, exactly. the, the, the cues where you can just get it wrong. And I, yeah. I'll call them out. I'll be up yeah, in their face me. when I say. <laughs> they don't. They don't do it around Neil. Okay. Let's yeah, be honest. Seen, let's come on. I've seen. Let me. Let's be, let me tell you something. This dude went on the Today Show. It was just like, hey, uh, you know that globe thing you got going in the beginning? It's wrong. It's totally oh, no, wrong. No, no, the Daily Show. That was the Daily. The show. Daily Show. That's it was what it spinning was. backwards. It was spinning backwards. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I, but I that was. Let you but buy. that was the beginning of the uh, interview. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. <laughs> so I, I love your message, one people, one sky. And that's very hopeful, very uh, peace-orienting thought there. 
So how do we get people, before we uh, continue, to get out and do more to look up? I mean, Neil's always saying, keep look, keep looking up. How about the people who aren't looking up at all? To They not keep looking up. How do they start looking up? I think a trip to a national park or state park in the darkest sky place um, is the best way to do this. Because many of the national parks in the U.S. and Canada are darkest sky designated locations, especially in the southwest U.S., some of my favorites, for example, in Arizona and Nevada border is the western end of uh, Grand Canyon um, or the Great Basin National Park. It's at high altitude in Nevada and it's also very dark. Uh, there are plenty of darkest sky locations in that area. All the five major national parks in Utah are darkest sky designated or going to be soon uh, in North Western Nevada, we have uh, the Black Rock Desert, another dark sky place, even very close to Las Vegas uh, on the way to BT, on the way to Death Valley, there's a dark sky area. Another place I have photographed many times is Cathedral Gorge, which is inside Nevada on the border of Utah. And it's just fascinating um, rock formations with the dark sky above it. Is there a map they can go to online? that identifies these dark spots? There are two ways to do that. One is um, lightpollutionmap.info. Uh, that's a website. And there is also a layer for Google Earth. Um, a university study provided this layer of, um, known as the, um, the map, the Atlas of Artificial Sky Glow. Um, and this, you can add it to your Google Earth, and then you can zoom in and see another place. Uh, another website is blue-marble.de. It's a German enthusiast who includes all these satellite images from every year. Uh, you can look at bird at night and find dark sky places near you. But do not forget that elevation is not there. So if you, even if you're in a bright area, but you find an elevated site, which is at least 4,000, 5,000 feet above sea level, then you start to see dark sky even within the cities. Gotcha. Mm, mm. Interesting. Very cool. And right now you are speaking to us from Iceland. What are you doing there today? From Reykjavik, Iceland, this was my last day after two weeks of a photo workshop capturing the Northern Lights and the Milky Way with a group coming from all around the country. I do this um, all around the world. I do this twice a year in March and September, known as Aurora Photo Tours. Oh, wow. So people can we, actually hang out with you and learn how to do what you're doing is, oh, look at that. Yeah, I do four or five workshops. Yeah, My invitation might still be in my inbox, I'm guessing. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Anytime now. Let me, I'll check. Let me check my inbox, see if I've ever been invited on this. Uh, so you made a career of this. This is, I, this is a, a, a brilliant, um, important, and uh, envious career path that you've made for yourself here. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank and uh, keep that going. And bye back. Thanks again for being our guest on Star Talk. We've got next up Bradley Mills. Bradley Mills, mm -hmm. you are Nevada Park Ranger, our very first park ranger. On I Star know. Talk. Welcome. welcome. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you guys are all cool with your outfits and you got your hat. You got that park oh, yeah. ranger. Do you, do you wear the park ranger hat? The, the smoky rim, bear hat? Like the smoky bear. Thank you, Neil. The smoky bear hat. <laughs> Absolutely. Look at that. It's the important now, part me, of the uniform. Just do me a favor, please. Just go, hey, boo boo. No. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so you are the lead astronomy ranger. And I'm so delighted to even know that such a person exists. And, yeah, it's, it's awesome. Uh, yeah, and so uh, as as a park ranger leading the astronomy effort, what it, what are your tasks? Well, uh, so Great Basin National Park, where where I work, we have one of the most extensive uh, astronomy program kind of sets uh, of probably any national park in the nation. Um, so I just get to to lead uh, essentially how we how we run it all um, and oversee. I've got a seasonal staff of about five park rangers uh, who get to focus solely on astronomy every single year. So I get wow. to, to work doing that, which is just an absolute delight. And let me just back up just for a moment. I, I, this park is a national park in Nevada. It's not a state park in Nevada, correct? 
That's correct. We're we're the only national park entirely within Nevada. So there are some other small smaller national park units, but we're the only one that is you know got that full special name. And wh- where exactly are you? Because I'm I'm telling you right now, all of this talk about Nevada and the dark skies is giving me a reason to go to Nevada because I've only been to Las Vegas <laughs> and yeah, Las, Vegas Las Vegas reminds me. It does not have dark skies. Not, it does not. not absolutely and it, not. <laughs> and it reminds me of work. So I would love another reason to go to Nevada. How close are you to Las Vegas or how easy are you to get to, I should say? We're one of the more difficult places to reach. Uh, there's no public transportation. There's a, only a couple highways that even come anywhere near us. Uh, so we're about five hours north of Las Vegas. And wow. we are, I mean, way out in the middle of nowhere. And that's that's the benefit. Because if we were anywhere anywhere near Vegas. It's the brightest spot on earth. So right, we got to get far, far away. So we're luckily about five hours north. It's a, it's a good Brad, track. Bradley, if you don't want me to come, just say, don't come. You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, lo- yeah. we love it. We're just, we're one of the least visited. It's so hard for people to get out here. You know, we get. Well, we'll try to change that right now. Year. Let's do we'll it. Try to change that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so you manage the great basin observatory. What is that? Cause be, just to be clear, when geologists, use the word observatory this it's just a place where they go stand and look around right so <laughs> when the astronomer says observatory we got real hardware there to connect you to the universe typically so which kind of observatory is this <laughs> i just love that you're dissing geologists <laughs> <laughs> don't call it observatory just standing there looking at an escarpment yeah, right. that's not an observatory that's just a, that's that's a scenic uh, out what do you call it? <laughs> A scenic overlook. <laughs> scenic overlook. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. so so luckily, I am not the one fully in charge of the Great Basin Observatory. We've got it was built by our uh, by the Great Basin National Park Foundation uh, entirely from donated funds, which is incredible. Um, but it's a proper research observatory. It's got the dome. It's got a, a seventy centimeter telescope. It is a. It's the real deal. Uh, and I think it's might even be one of the largest in Nevada. I, I don't, could only find information on one other research grade observatory in the state. So we're, uh-huh. we're pretty special having that out here. And uh, wow. it's, it's a lot of fun. So what's the, what's the elevation of the Great Basin Observatory? So uh, the observatory is right around 68, 6,900 feet. Um, so it's, oh my gosh. Yeah, That's it's up high there. up. Yeah, our park wow, wow. starts at like, like pretty much no lower than 6,000 and goes all the way up to the highest or well, second highest point in Nevada uh, at Wheeler Peak at 13,063 feet. So it's and what and what point do you range. hallucinate <laughs> <laughs> from, from lack of oxygen? <laughs> you we have people suffering from altitude sickness even this low. So I'm sure that it doesn't take you, you know, to get that high to have that happen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, my favorite thing to observe is what happens to unopened bags of potato chips. Yeah. that you bring to high altitude. Right. They get really, really puffy. Yeah. And <laughs> exactly. I, I just, I love these secondary experiments you can do at, at high altitude. So what is this we heard here about a star train? What is that? So the uh, Nevada Northern Railway is a uh, historic railway line that operates out of Ely, Nevada. And they uh, run a train, have been running this train in, uh, for 10 years in partnership with the park uh, that goes from Ely, Nevada about... Uh, 15, 20 miles north of town and uh, to a uh, telescope flats where we've got telescopes set up and let people kind of hop off the train. They get to look through telescopes. We do ranger programs and trivia and astronomy, just fun things, you know, give out prizes and stuff on the train. Uh, And we get to ride back uh, in the middle of the night. Chuck, doesn't this sound like a a setup for one of the scenes in Westworld where you take some, some, little, yeah, train. some little train to go out into the desert and all of a sudden, yeah. right, exactly. And I'm, there's I'm a saloon for, there and a gunfighter right. ready to And then all of a sudden, Ed, Ed Harris shows up and you're just like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, it does kind of sound like that. So uh, It is, so, it is. Sorry, I interrupted. The train goes from where to where? Uh, so it goes from Ely, Nevada, up the Steptoe Valley. So it actually doesn't come into the park, but it's uh, it's still in the Great Basin, which is about the size of Nevada. Mm-hmm. So it's a very similar environment, and we still get some excellent, excellent night skies out there. So you said you need that you have a telescope set up. What do I need to bring? Here I am, a person. I'm just like, okay, why not? Let's go stargazing. I'll give it a try. What do <laughs> I need to bring? If you're coming to the park in one of our programs, just yourself and a, a sense of enthusiasm. That's all you need. 
because we've got all the other equipment, we've got uh, all the knowledge, and we'd love to share it. So it makes it really easy for for people to come and experience the night sky. Wow. Uh, yeah. The amount of times I have people who have come out here never seeing the Milky Way, sometimes never even seeing more than five, six stars in the sky, and then get that to come here. That was me growing up, yes. Yeah. <laughs> count yeah. me among those. <laughs> um, me too. I, I grew up in San Diego County, and it, you know I counted maybe 10 stars in a planet every once in a while, and then come out here and every night in the summer even sometimes when there's a lot of moon you get to see the milky way it's it's incredible it's, it's life changing do you ever do you ever play um audio of neil degrasse tyson so that people feel like they're looking up at a planetarium <laughs> <laughs> we what well, we let them know we poke lots there's of the holes audio you know, so and now, so many stars you, you know? <laughs> exactly it's just a dome it's just yeah a exactly dome. so i uh, Generally, the best observing sites in the world are in deserts. So just to remind me of my geography, is all of Nevada count as a desert? Essentially, uh, big, big, big sections of it. So we're in the Great Basin Desert out here. And so, you know, we get very, very little annual rainfall. We are incredibly high up. So we got the high elevation. You know, we're high desert, dry. It really, really adds to making this such an excellent place for for stargazing. Right, because the drier it is, the the fewer air molecules are in the air to disrupt the, 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 the starlight and fewer clouds and less rain. And so everything works. So exactly. So exactly. you're pretty much guaranteed a clear night. Anytime you schedule this, isn't that right? No, not necessarily. We have uh -oh. a pretty intense monsoon season through, through July and August and we get, oh. get programs rained out every once in a while, but if it's just cloudy, we can always find something in the clouds. It's it's still dark enough here that even if you only have, you know, that much in the sky, you can still find, you know, a nebula or a galaxy or something in there to be able oh, to show wow. people. Yeah. Okay, when you say cloudy, you don't mean overcast. You mean clouds in the sky. Yes, right. Yeah. You look in between clouds. Got yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Can you quantify how dark the sky is? I mean, is there ways to know who qualifies and who doesn't? So, so we measure luminance here using, I actually even grabbed it. Uh, we have a little sky quality meter that we go around oh, wow. uh, once a it's month. It's like a, and like a camera light meter. Pretty much. We point it at the yeah. sky. No, no, it's a tricorder. It's like, it's a sky tricorder. <laughs> 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 oh, I should have said that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got you. I beat you to it. Uh, <laughs> hold it up to the sky. Go. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay. <laughs> She's dead, so, Jim. Okay. <laughs> it's cloudy, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So, you know, I just pointed in my office, it just said 8.5, which means it's bright and daytime, but it can go up to 22 is, is where we, we want to kind of hang out at. And Great Basin's right around like 21.6, 21.8, which means we have some of the darkest skies that are, are measured in this country. So, so the bigger the number, the darker the sky. The darker That's the correct. Sky. Just in case that was not nice. clear. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Got it. When we think of national parks and national forests, for example, there's a maintenance budget for it you know, for, for hiking paths, perhaps, or fire management tasks that they go mm -hmm. through for, for the astronomy club, <laughs> <from Nevada. laughs> what, what kind of management is necessary there other than maybe j just the upkeep of the telescope? That's a big part of it is just maintaining our equipment. Um, but I get a new, I like to kind of say, if I get a fresh crop of rangers every year. So they, we got some people that return and otherwise I've got new folks who we got to train up and got to get them uh, learning more about the sky if they're still, you know, just kind of feeling the amateur level and wanting to get to that point where they can really, really teach people. But otherwise, it's pretty simple and it's just managing, uh, just managing the people. And we also get a lot of volunteers here throughout the year for some of our big festivals and other things that we do. So there's a lot of, a lot of work put into that as well. If you're an am amateur astronomer, it's a really great thing to get out to you because you can get paid for being an amateur astronomer. That's right. That's right. Which would that make you a professional astronomer? <laughs> I guess so. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all I'm saying is you got a, you got a nice shiny badge there. I'm telling you, if I came out there, I would say I don't need no stinking badges. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need no stinking badges. Man, I know this guy. Nice. Um, so, so do you have to go through uh, like brush up classes or something? you know, to just stay on top of the constellations and the latest discoveries that you might then add to the stuff you point out? Like, how do yeah. you stay current? 
Well, so it's just a lot of uh, just doing research. And, you know, when you have downtime or if a program gets canceled, it means we get to spend more time learning. So we read a lot of publications. We're always keeping an eye on what's going to be above us in the sky that night, obviously, you know, so we can point out things like uh, cool space missions that might be happening. We got to see some uh, rocket boosters recently. We were just even talking to people about the Osiris mission that uh, just landed last week. So it's been a, we get a lot of very, very cool things that happen near us uh, that are very visible that you wouldn't really necessarily be able to see if you right. were no, not I'm in the sky I'm very glad like to hear that because, yeah, the universe is not just the stars as they're laid out for us on Earth. There's this whole frontier of research unfolding that does make headlines, right? It's not even obscure. You know, with the OSIRIS-REx mission, it was a piece of an asteroid brought back to Earth. Which is crazy. In, in an adjacent, uh, landing in an adjacent state, right? Right there in Utah. So, okay. Well, this is a delight to meet you, Bradley. Yeah. And I'm, I'm even more delighted to know that someone such as you exists in this country or even in the world who's tasked with bringing the night sky to the public and preserving the night sky in the interest of civilization. There's hope for us yet. There yes, is. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Bradley, give us a parting sentence. Give us a parting sentence to take us out. If you ever get the chance, come out to Nevada, broaden your horizons, see the night sky as it naturally should be. All right. Okay. So I'll summarize that say and say, <laughs> keep looking up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. We're out of here. Th thanks, Bradley. Always good to have you, Chuck. Always a pleasure. This has been a stargazing edition of Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist, as always, leading you to keep looking up. <laughs> <laughs>